Cooking is a big part of the conference, and so don't worry, there'll be plenty of time to visit during lunch. Uh, I, I still think we should have named this conference the Living Legends Conference, because we really have a, another gentleman here that's going to give us a really, really great perspective on a hard to pronounce word called psilocybins. That's how you pronounce it, right, Thomas? Psilocybins? All right, good. Glad I didn't embarrass myself. So we are thrilled to welcome Mr. Thomas Hartle, a strong advocate for the use of psilocybin in end-of-life care. Thomas became the first Canadian, the first Canadian is joining us to receive psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy and is currently a passionate advocate for the therapy. So let's welcome this living legend to Saskatoon. symptomatic for a number of months and uh, they had thought that I had Crohn's disease at that time. I had uh, already spent about a, a month in the hospital uh, dealing with the symptoms from a partial bowel obstruction and uh, in April of 2016 that partial obstruction became a full obstruction and uh, I had to go in and do something about that. So the uh, the anticipated surgery, which uh, was supposed to only take a couple of hours, turned into this uh, six-hour affair, and uh, I woke up from that uh, not being complete, but now having a uh, ileostomy, and uh, learning that I had stage four colon cancer. So that was a, uh, a bit of a uh, shock to the system, as I'm sure you can probably imagine. You uh, here uh, have much more experience with many more patients than I do. But uh, finding out that you have uh, stage four cancer and what they have to offer you is going to be palliative care are not a lot of words you want to hear when you are uh, 48 and have a couple of young children who are both on the autism spectrum and uh, need a lot of personal care themselves. The, uh, the surgery then led into uh, 12 rounds of chemotherapy and we scheduled a second surgery for 2017 where I underwent a reversal of my ileostomy and uh, they had one bowel resection to do and that was really it. The uh, surgeon who performed the second operation uh, really felt that they had uh, gotten everything that there was to get. Uh, they couldn't see any more obvious lesions that were in there and he basically told me to go home and enjoy life and uh, and I was not on any kind of active treatment following that. So um, I was going in for my regular uh, CT scans every three months. All of those uh, CT scans were uh, coming back perfectly clear. So the idea that things were going really well was uh, very strong. Uh, I thought that I had the, the cancer very well under control and unfortunately wasn't the case. I started to uh, exhibit some more symptoms in uh, 2019. Uh, for me, those were manifesting as anemia. And I went in to talk to my family doctor about that and confirmed that with uh, blood tests and scheduled a uh, colonoscopy where we found uh, two bleeding tumors on my large intestine, which were completely undetected by any of these PET scans that I'd been having. So, um, that was my uh, introduction to how unnerving it can be to discover that not only are best diagnostic tools not always as effective as we would like them to be, but the realization that my cancer had progressed when I thought that everything was completely under control. We uh, scheduled a third surgery for the uh, summer of 2019 where the intention was to remove the rest of my large intestine and uh, I probably have a, a permanent ostomy at that time. 
that uh, was not the way that that surgery went either. That seems to be uh, a common theme for me in surgery. Um, uh, the, uh, the surgeon opened me up and there, uh, well, they looked around in 51 different places and I had tumors in 42 of those 51 places. So uh, progressed considerably in the, uh, the interim that uh, I thought that everything was going great. So uh, there wasn't really a lot they could do for me in that third surgery that just closed things up again. And uh, I started chemotherapy. Uh, this uh, is not a prop. Today is chemo day three for me. Sometime this afternoon, my uh, lovely wife will disconnect me and I will have completed my 75th round of chemotherapy. So that, uh, that has kind of been my journey. Um, chemo will be something that I will likely be continuing for as long as I have breathing is my understanding. So, uh, but if things progress well for me, there's a possibility I can go to every three weeks instead of two, for example. So, so I've been making good progress. Now, my uh, my experience in learning that the scans were not effective in being able to show my disease. Um, that is really the point where my real end of life distress started for me. Uh, up until that point, I was really feeling fairly confident that I had this cancer thing under control. And, uh, you know, everything will be just fine because that's what we want it to be, right? But uh, learning that uh, they can't tell me exactly how bad the cancer is on any day, uh, is the chemotherapy helping? Is it staying the same? Are things getting worse? Um, that, uh, that not knowing was probably uh, the worst thing for me. And uh, that is something that sort of gradually grows over time. It's uh, that whole uh, old story of, you know, if you, uh, you put a frog into hot water, it jumps right out, but you raise the temperature slowly and it'll stay there. This uh, end of life distress and anxiety is a lot like that. We had uh, a number of, uh, you know, events in my life that were contributing to that. My, uh, my mother-in-law passed away in November of 2019. Uh, my father-in-law with stage four cancer came to live with us and uh, he passed away about a month later in our home. Uh, my own father passed away in April following that. And uh, I had a niece of mine pass away from uh, adrenal cancer a couple of weeks after that. So the first six month period uh, in 2019-2020 uh, was really emotionally kind of rough, particularly with a number of people passing away from the, the same thing that I've had. And I've been sick with cancer for a lot longer than any of they were. So uh, the, the idea of uh, death feeling very intimate and uh, immediate was very present for me. Um, the funny thing about it is when you're under that sort of anxiety for uh, any kind of an extended period of time, it sort of becomes your normal. And you don't really notice the kind of stress and strain that you're under on a daily basis um, while you are in it. And uh, you know, I can say that after I've had uh, my psilocybin therapy, which I'll be getting to, the, uh, the only way that I really truly understood the kind of really deep anxiety that I was in was by its absence. And I think that's probably something that's common to a lot of people. We get used to uh, a lot of things. It's uh, like a kind of pain that is there all the time, but uh, in, in the same way that you can get used to uh, the smell of paint in a room, this uh, constant state of discomfort is something that is just something you can get used to after a while, and you don't even notice it, even though it's having these physiological effects on you as well, which uh, is, is something I will mention uh, a little bit. So I guess uh, the next question that uh, is obvious is why would I be looking at uh, psychedelics as a therapy when uh, there are obviously a lot of other therapeutic options that are available to people? And uh, I guess the simple answer to that is I've had a chance to to try some of the other things that are available. 
Um, I have been on antidepressants at other times in my life. And for me personally, while uh, I found the antidepressants were effective at taking the peaks off of anxiety, they were also taking the peaks off of desirable emotions like feelings of love and you know, compassion and connectedness. So for me, I did not really feel like having my world be beige as a, a good trade-off for uh, getting rid of the anxiety. I didn't want to not experience anything in life. I wanted to uh, obviously be here and present for the experiences for the time that I've got left. And without knowing exactly how much that is, and I, I realize that nobody really knows how much time you have left, but uh, having terminal cancer makes that so much more personal and immediate. It uh, adds an urgency to things. And I didn't want to miss out on any of those experiences that I could have been having and sharing with my family. Um, I'd had some limited success with uh, things like uh, meditation and uh, some cognitive behavioral stuff, but um, really the, uh, the anxiety that I was experiencing some days would uh, have me in a state where you're so overwhelmed that you have to be in a dark room where it's quiet and just one more piece of input is more than you can possibly handle uh, to you can't be away from somebody because that uh, when you have cancer, any little ache or pain that you have must be something terrible happening with the cancer, right? What else could it possibly be? And uh, you know, for me, uh, any, any digestive issues that I would have, uh, because I've got tumors on my uh, small intestines, I'm under the understanding that at some point they have weaknesses, they could have a rupture or I could have another blockage. So something as simple as a gas cramp was more than enough to put me into a full-on panic attack, thinking today's the day, right? So um, it was really robbing me of uh, my ability to function with uh, my family on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I like to tell people that uh, in that sort of a state that felt like I was actively dying. I wasn't really living my life at that point. Uh, I wasn't participating and uh, Quite frankly, it, uh, it felt like I had to do something. I was extremely desperate to find an answer to, uh, to be able to return to some semblance of normality. So, um, I, uh, I had discovered that uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy was a thing. Um, I discovered that actually fairly early on in my uh, cancer treatment, probably around 2018. Now in 2018, uh, I wasn't really suffering from any type of anxiety like this because this is that period where I was under the impression that things were going great. But I had that knowledge in my head and I had that squirreled away and um, it was uh, very useful to me and I revisited the, uh, the data for the Johns Hopkins study and uh, upon a better reading, discovered that they were getting something like 80% success rates with people who had literally the exact same condition that I had. So stage four cancer, end of life distress. Now, I am uh, I like to consider myself to be a fairly analytical, scientific person. Uh, you know, I believe in the data that comes through from these things. And if a reputable place like Johns Hopkins says they're getting 80% success rates, then Far be it for me to uh, to overlook something like that. So I started looking around for any clinical trials that were available here in Canada. Um, of course, back in uh, 2019 and early 2020, there was uh, literally nothing available. But I eventually got a hold of uh, a company called Therasil. They're a patient advocacy group, and they assisted me with getting my Section 56 uh, exemption which allowed me to get access to the therapy. Um, the uh, treatments were performed by uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce Tobin. And uh, the, uh, I guess some of the key points that I'd like to point out is the difference between therapy versus a recreational use of psychedelics. Because there is a really big difference. Uh, and lots of people you know, have experimented with uh, Psychedelics of various kinds, they go to a concert, see pretty colors and, and things like that. And 
you know, you don't come out of the experience uh, stopping smoking or, or feeling bad about your, your end of life distress. The, uh, the real key component in this is the therapy. And I can't stress that enough to people. This is not something where you, you take some magic mushrooms and suddenly everything's all okay. The magic mushrooms, the psilocybin or ketamine or whatever the psychedelic is being used in this, it's a tool that helps to get your ego out of the way. Uh, I sort of think of it a little bit like uh, therapy or meditation on steroids. So uh, for me, in the experience, you, uh, you set these intentions and expectations for what you would like to get out of the therapy. And when you are actually under the influence of the, uh, the psychedelics, you are more able to reach those dark, hard to get to places. So um, for example, for me, uh, some of the more painful things that I have, it's not so much the dying part of this process, it's more the idea that I would not be there for my family at some point when they needed me for something. Uh, having a couple of special needs children is, uh, it's an extra burden, uh, an extra urgency to try to get things ready for them when you're not going to be around. Everybody dies, right? But um, for me, the thought of dying before I was able to give them everything that they needed was a really difficult form for me to deal with. In fact, prior to my psilocybin therapy, I would not have even been able to say these sentences without a real emotional outburst. So that can sort of show you how uh, the therapy itself can remove the pain from some of these uh, things that we're dealing with. Um, for me, it was uh, a very much an ego death experience. So, uh, it uh, what was comforting for me was it gave me a chance to experience how my consciousness could exist uh, in a way that had nothing to do with this life or the fact that I had a family or I had pain from the cancer or you know the faces of my friends or anything like that. And for me, it was comforting because. It was perhaps a glimpse at what life after death could be, uh, a continuation of this uh, consciousness in a way that was completely fine and acceptable, but uh, different from this reality. Now, things for uh, accessing treatments these days are getting an awful lot better. Um, we now have more mechanisms available to, uh, to patients than just the Section 56. Um, the government is really trying to transition away from the Section 56 access, so they are encouraging people to use what's uh, now the SAP program, which is more uh, a doctor center. So with the Section 56, the, uh, the patient does the application, the patient is responsible for procuring the uh, psilocybin, uh, for finding a therapist, for arranging basically all of the components of this. Uh, the patient does have the, uh, the freedom of where they get the psilocybin from, so in my case I grew my own, but uh, there are now some licensed producers coming online who are going to be able to, I believe, supply a uh, safe supply of psilocybin to people through a uh, Section 56 as well. Under the SAP program, the doctor is responsible for filling out, uh, I believe it's an eight-page form. Uh, the doctor procures the psilocybin, stores it, uh, is responsible for the administration of the therapy and reporting back the results of that. So um, more of a uh, doctor-centric approach to that. The uh, biggest challenge that we have as a patient these days is that there are not so many doctors who are um, qualified, willing, uh, informed on this type of a therapy. So if I can get any message out to the folks in the room here, that would be something that would be very, very helpful to patients like myself, would be uh, for as many medical practitioners to become informed in this process. Um, it's, it's definitely something that is very life-changing for a lot of people. So that, uh, that is something that I would really like to, uh, to get out there. There, uh, there is one other possible way that we can get uh, access to this. 
Um, we've already heard about the uh, debate system, and I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with that. Now, my understanding of the, uh, the whole main system is that it is in place as a mechanism for alleviating suffering for people. And uh, I believe it's a very important thing as an option for, for patients. I most certainly know a lot of individuals who have signed up for the main paperwork and uh, some of whom have had the psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy as well. Um, some of those people who have gone through the psilocybin therapy have uh, decided that they would now just like to let nature take its course. Um, so their, their fear of dying or the fear of the pain that they would be experiencing has been uh, reduced to the point where they no longer wish to, uh, to go through with the assisted death. I know other people who have decided that they do want to proceed with the, uh, the assistance in dying, but they have gone through that process in a much more peaceful way. So uh, having the psilocybin assisted therapy in their case was something that uh, granted them more composure and peace with the end of their life, more comfort with the dying process. So for those people that this is helpful for, it's helpful in some uh, very powerful ways for them. And uh, while I understand that uh, psilocybin assisted therapy is not a, a one uh, shoe fits all for everybody, there are a large number of people that I know would benefit from this. And my whole reason for advocacy for this is to bring awareness to this as a potential therapy to help people with their end of life distress and to try to uh, encourage uh, open mindedness for something that when I first heard about it I thought sounded as crazy as anything, I guarantee it. But uh, having had experienced this myself on uh, a few occasions and I do find that I do need a top up on my treatment every uh, six months or so, um, it has been nothing short of life changing for me. I am now uh, no longer actively dying. I feel like I am genuinely actively living now. And uh, the time that I have left with my family is uh, much more connected, empathetic, and better in every way. Um, for those of you who uh, do, uh, do care with people like myself, there's the, uh, the added bonus that you get from the better uh, state of mind that I'm in. So I, I take uh, chemotherapy every two weeks. I do get uh, inflammation in the areas where I'm uh, affected by the cancer, but I find that uh, when I'm close to one of my psilocybin sessions, because I have this improvement in my state of mind and my emotional well-being, it also reduces things like the inflammatory response. So it may be worth looking into to see if things like these emotional uh, therapies are also able to give us better treatment responses going forward as well. So I'm hoping that there are some people here who may benefit from that little tidbit as well. I think that uh, concludes that part of the program. I'm hoping that uh, some people have some questions for me. I'll be more than happy to answer anything you have. for Dahl right here. <laughs> she only has one working hand and she got it up fast. <laughs> Hi, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, is there a list of criteria that needs to be met for this um, administration? And, or is it is it sort of uh, based on patient needs and doctors sort of So um, there are sort of different requirements between uh, the Section 56 and the SAP, but the general rules of thumb are uh, have other modalities been tried, and uh, is this treatment resistant? So uh, Health Canada is really encouraging other options to be explored prior to uh, going to a psychedelic therapy. My, uh, my hope is, is that one day, of course, this will be added to the list of standard treatments that are available for people, but um, right now they are looking for more of the treatment resistance and uh, urgent aspects as well. 
So uh, many, many of the people that I know who are stage four and getting this treatment, um, it is on occasion being uh, administered really as a last, a last minute sort of a thing, which is unfortunate. Um, it would be great if you could administer it a little earlier and uh, it improved the quality of life that these people are able to have with their families. With this, where do you find out about it? Do I just Google um, Section 56 or, or the Special Assistance Program? Mm -hmm. I would say your best bet for getting information would be to uh, look up the Theracil website. That's uh, Theracil, T-H-E-R-A-P-S-I-L, theracil.ca. Um, as a patient advocacy group, they are really well informed and uh, have a, a great deal of information on their website for the different programs, people that you need to get in touch with. So a good starting point. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it makes these connections which are still there after the psychedelic wears off. And this is where the third part, the integration therapy happens. So the discussion of the experience and uh, being able to find the meaning that it has for you. Those are, uh, those are the things where the real healing happens on a long-term basis. So uh, when I say it's like therapy on steroids, the psychedelic allows you to get at some of these hot potato issues that you don't want to go anywhere near in your normal life and to be able to process those in a little bit more of a pain-free way. And having done that, it changes your perspectives. We've got time. We have time for one more question, right here in the middle. Hi. This topic is very fascinating. Are there any negatives? Like, do you get sick to your stomach? Like, what actually happens when you're going through this trip? <laughs> it's definitely a trip. <laughs> so, uh, some common things that you will get out of uh, the onset of the psychedelic, particularly in the kind of doses that I take. Uh, there is commonly what they call come up anxiety. So when your perceptions start to get altered, uh, there is quite often a feeling of anxiety to go along with. Things are getting a little weird. And uh, that is uh, really common, but a little more gentle with uh, natural mushrooms as opposed to the synthetic. Um, the natural mushroom being a gradual incline to it, um, a little more gentle, and it has a bit of the effect of dulling down the anxiety just by the psilocybin itself. Um, the, uh, the synthetic was a little more abrupt, so uh, I experienced probably a little more anxiety with that at the earlier part of the trip. Uh, nausea, very common. Um, for dealing with that, I will typically take on Danstrom um, at the same time as I'm taking my psilocybin, and uh, that has served me very well. So instead of being caught up in feeling nauseous in the experience, then uh, I'm, I'm more concentrating on what's happening with the experience itself. Uh, I did the uh, Johns Hopkins protocol, which means you take your psilocybin, you put on a blindfold, and you listen to music and headphones. So uh, it's a very internal process. Um, the music, of course, is uh, different tracks that are aimed at uh, different emotional responses. Some, some are more conducive of joy, some uh, more sadness, some energizing. So by going through a, a, a selection of these different things, they're hoping to be able to find where your particular traumas or troubles lie. So, um, for me, um, every person's psychedelic experience is a little different. Um, for me, I had uh, the music create these uh, immersive universes. And as they manifested, my consciousness just became those spaces. So, it wasn't like being in this room as an experience. It was being the room and everything in it. So uh, when people talk about this feeling of connectedness, I literally felt like I was many different universes as each musical track changed, which uh, for anybody who has not been on a psychedelic sounds very crazy, I realize. <laughs> That's what it is. And, and uh, while you are in these different states, um, if you have had the ego death experience like I've had, then the idea of Thomas didn't exist whatsoever family or what the faces look like for any part of this world. But uh, one thing that I did come back from that experience with was the idea that the only place that I really experienced any sadness or pain was here in this reality. And everything else was just better. So if that is a possibility at all, then the idea of dying isn't necessarily so bad. Well, Thomas, on behalf of the group, thanks for sharing your story. Please accept our well wishes for your continued health and recovery, and, and a huge round of applause for such a remarkable day.